Uh, welcome everyone. Good evening. This is our British Columbia book study on Lindsay Kemeny's Seven Mighty Moves. This is session three for November 4th and we're really excited that you're here um, where we will discuss uh, some of the moves from the book and uh, engage in discussion for uh, an opportunity to connect with other professionals from around the province that are here to um, share their learning and their insights into the world of literacy. So I am very grateful to be coming to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Simshan and Samaic speaking peoples who have been stewards of this land since time immemorial. And the image of uh, the day for me is from a climate park, which is a half block from my front door. And it's where I was today. Although it was not sunny, this was a, a summer photo that I happened to take. But it was so lovely to be in the park where we have one of our spawning routes in the creek that leads up to the salmon hatchery where I served on the board for many years. And so I feel very grateful that I live so close to this important landmark in our community as it reminds us that um, salmon is very integral to uh, Indigenous communities, uh, including my own family. Erica, I'll pass it to you. Great, thank you. Uh, so I am going to rec uh, respectfully sorry, acknowledge uh, that uh, I am coming to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Cowets and Peoples, uh, and I'm honored uh, and grateful to live, work, uh, and learn here. My image of the day happens to be a very sacred ancestral um, site that happens to be a about a 10 minute walk from my house. Uh, this is a place called Yayam Nuts, and it was discovered in um, the 1990s when a developer was uh, looking to develop the area. And uh, the school district and other partnerships with Couch and Tribes have um, really worked hard to now create this as an outdoor learning space. Um, and so you can go and um, read about the history of the area itself, of the plants that are there, and of the uh, village that, that was there once upon a time, as well as the, the um, burial grounds. So it's on my bucket list to take the 10 minute walk very soon and, and go, go check it out. So we're very fortunate to have it so close um, in, in, our, in our own valley and um, some schools within walking distance as well that use it as an outdoor classroom. All right. Uh, so as Katie said, welcome back, everybody. For those of you that are maybe have uh, are just joining us for the first time tonight, my name is Erica Roberts, um, and uh, I am an intermediate teacher in the Cowichan Valley. And uh, my journey into literacy really became a, a big thing a couple of years ago. And uh, if you are an intermediate teacher like I am, you'll know that it's tough to find uh, understanding and um, strategies and interventions to help our students in intermediate. And I can say the best thing I ever did was sign up for the Vancouver Island University uh, Literacy Language and Learning uh, graduate program. I have learned so much in the last year and a half and continue to learn um, so that I can um, do a much better job of, of supporting my students in intermediate who are coming to me and still cannot read. And I want them leaving my classroom making progress in that area. So, Katie. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Thanks, Erica, that um, being part of the first cohort for VIU in the Triple L program has been a lifeline where uh, that's where I met you. And I think it really has helped me gain an understanding of some of the complexities around literacy instruction at the intermediate level in particular, as I'm a primary teacher and feel that, you know, a lot of those foundational skills that are so integral to the learning process um, are, are necessary when we plan as a school community in how we want to target those literacy skills. And so you've been really insightful in helping me understand that. So thank you very much. And it was VIU that allowed us to uh, meet and here we are now. So super duper. Yeah. Uh, it, and it has been great. We've met a lot of really good people and have made some networking. Sorry, go ahead, Una, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so last week we were, um, we delved into, uh, some phonics instruction, 
Uh, and one of the things we did was a mentee. And we thought it would be nice to recap our, um, our word cloud uh, on, on what effective uh, phonics instruction is. And so these were the, the lovely words that everybody uh, entered into the, uh, the Mentimeter. And uh, we I know there was some great discussion within um, the, the breakout rooms. Breakout and we rooms, yeah. Hope, yeah, hope to do that again tonight. Yeah, we do have a couple of mentees and uh, we should also give us, uh, maybe give a shout out to Una Malcolm who is joining us from Dyslexia yes. Canada. She's the, uh, she's the tech right now and uh, has been helping us with the mentees as well. So thank you, Una, for giving us all that support and encouragement. But uh, yeah, we think these word clouds are kind of fun and it was worth um, uh, a slide just to recap our learning from last session. So we are going to move on. And uh, Erica, what are we yeah. what are we doing for a prize? Well, we had a great chat about this because we yeah. had we had a different book for our prize the first couple of sessions. So this time, one lucky participant is going to win uh, the art and science um, teaching primary reading by Christopher Such. It's a great book. Um, and so uh, we will announce the winner at the end of our session tonight. So here's what the shape of the session is. Uh, we're sticking to the format that we've used in session one and two. Uh, we are addressing move number four using decodable texts instead of predictable texts with beginning readers. And this was particularly um, interesting. And I think we're gonna sort of touch on that a little bit later, Erica. Um, you gave me some great perspective. Uh, we'll do our breakout and focus on that move number four, and then we'll move into move number five, and we'll talk about embracing a better approach to teaching sight words. And uh, I think this is a real hot topic right now in, in uh, primary networks. So we'll do a breakout for move number five. Um, of course, we'll have our takeaways as well, and we'll do the book draw and uh, prepare for our final session on November 18th. Awesome. So before we begin, we would like to again ground ourselves in First Peoples Principles of Learning. This is a guiding document for BC's curriculum. And as I've mentioned before, it's one that really does speak to um, curricular content and our instructional practices in the classroom, but also um, to us as lifelong learners. So learning does involve patience and time. And this is our gentle reminder that we are all entering this work at different stages and we are all on our own personal and professional learning journey. And we are mindful of being kind and generous with our time as we continue this learning. And the other principle we wanted to focus on is learning involves recognizing the consequences of one's actions. And we know that this is often a sensitive conversation and, but we, we really felt, in fact, we just talked about it before we um, came on at seven, that literacy affects all other areas of learning. And we know that this is an equity piece in education. And for some districts and for some regions in our province, there are disproportionately high percentages of at-risk or marginalized students who are not reading and writing with proficiency. So we know that structured literacy allows us to cast the widest net so that we can support all learners. Mm -hmm. uh, Erica, I know we also talked about the uh, professional learning standards and maybe you yeah. want to on that. So in, in our preparation for this session, we talked at great length uh, ab about this um, principle of learning. And, and one of the areas that, that uh, I speak to a lot when I'm having conversations is our professional teaching standards in BC number seven uh, specifically speaks about our own professional learning and it, it very clearly states that we do need to develop and refine our personal philosophies of education, teaching and learning uh, as informed by research um, and uh, also informed by practice and informed by the professional standards for educators. And when we don't do this, there are consequences to those actions. And sometimes our students will lose out, but also ourselves as professional learners. Um, you know, uh, research changes all the time. It's okay to acknowledge that, that you know, maybe we haven't been doing certain things in, in the best way. And when we know better, we do better. And if we don't do that, then there are consequences to that. 
Thanks, Erica. Uh, let's move on to our first move, move number four, using decodable texts instead of predictable texts with beginning readers. And when Erica and I were reviewing our notes and trying to uh, create our talking points, one of the interesting things that I found from our conversation is that Erica said she wasn't familiar with what predictable texts are or were are. And so um, that was really great learning and very insightful for me as a primary teacher. I, you know, uh, I have had experiences teaching with predictable texts as it was what was in our schools and in our classrooms. Um, it never made sense to me to use predictable texts in an early primary setting, kindergarten, grade one, that contain words like rhinoceros or ice cream, et cetera. So when decodable text came on, it made so much sense and I just couldn't wait to get my hands on some of these beautiful new books. So it was a real light bulb moment for me. And I know Erica, when we talked about it, you were, um, uh, it, it talked about your journey as far as how you came to decodable texts or controlled texts at the intermediate level. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Um, uh, pr predictable text. I'm an intermediate teacher. They're supposed to come to me in grade four or five knowing how to read. I wouldn't have any use for a predictable text, really, when you think about it. And yet, um, the learning and and that I've done within, uh, as I said, the the VIU program. One of the things that we did watch was the Purple Challenge, and I highly yes. recommend that if you have not watched the Purple Challenge, please go look it up on YouTube. I was uh, I speechless. I really was like, wow, okay, now I know what we're talking about as far as predictable text. I still don't use them in intermediate, but after watching that and coming in as a, as a blank slate teacher with no use of predictable text and no real knowledge, I was like, well, I'm not so sure I'm going to use those ever. Uh, it really is an important video um, to go and have a look, not the best thing for our readers. And, you know, even I was able to see that just by watching one video and then engaging in discussion, of course, with our cohort classmates. Um, right. You know, it it really, it, it didn't change my thinking. It just was like, wow, okay, not going in that direction. And I can't imagine what it's like for a, a primary teacher who may have been using and still using predictable texts. Um, and, and, you know, change is difficult, but if you haven't seen purple challenge, please go look it up. It's an excellent video for this. I'm sure the conversation will be rich as always, when mm -hmm. we talk about, um, you know, what's happening in our classrooms and hopefully sharing, um, some ideas and experiences with, um, those in our groups. So why don't we move on to move number four and we can look at our discussion questions. So number one, how does this move connect to our British Columbia language arts curriculum? And how does it specifically connect to your grade and your role? So we do have a range of um, uh, educators with us that are teaching at various levels in various contexts. So I think that uh, leads to rich discussion. Um, the next one, number two, what experience do you have with predictable texts? And I think that's a great place to start. Let's start with those experiences that we do know and maybe think about how we might want to move forward in our learning. Have you noticed the same issues as Lindsay when it comes to the disconnect between these books and phonics instruction? Number three, what are decodable texts and what experiences do you have using them with students? And number four, what misconceptions does Lindsay discuss regarding decodable texts? And which one was your biggest concern before reading the chapter? And has uh, the author helped to alleviate any of your worries? And number five, what are some suggestions Lindsay makes for using decodable texts in the classroom? And what ideas might you try in your current role and context? So we thought we'd allow 15 minutes for this. This is a bigger conversation. And we would be uh, welcoming those to uh, share in the chat when we return as a, a larger group. And uh, then we'll move on and, and carry the conversation with our takeaways. All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, so we're going to just invite those of you that are comfortable uh, to share a little something in uh, the chat feature that resonated 
uh, with you from your breakout discussion. Um, I know I popped into one of the rooms, so hopefully you all have some things to share or say and just pop that right in the chat. It takes it, we always got to remember to give them a minute to type it out. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, predictable text leads to guessing. And that is a extremely difficult habit to break. And I've, I've found in my kindergarten experience that it is quite a natural um, strategy for kids to shift their eyes away from the word to look at the picture as their brain is scrambling to find meaning in the words that they are decoding. Mm -hmm. uh, sounds like Michelle and company had a good discussion about nonfiction decodables and got some recommendations. That's great. Yeah, nonfiction decodable books. Um, there's a few that are coming out and uh, we wanted to give a shout out to West Coast Literacy, which is a uh, distributing company in British Columbia that is really trying to sort of break into that market and support um, educators and schools and districts to bring in some of the uh, Canadian content in particular, but as well as other series. And so if you are feeling comfortable, um, we'd love to hear what you are using. And that is um, really helpful to those that are maybe just beginning and wanting to know more about how to incorporate decodable texts in their classrooms. Yeah, thank you, Kathy, yeah. for putting in the link to Silisense. And yeah, and Catherine for mentioning West Coast Literacy, they definitely have some awesome decodables there, especially for intermediates. They don't look like, you know, the primary decodables. That's yeah, great. And that's important for older striving readers that um, are wanting something that might not be, you know, looking or feeling so um, juvenile. So I think that's great. Mm -hmm. We did have a question uh, in the group that I was in, and I see, Michelle, you've put it here in the chat as well. Does anyone recognize the decodables that Lindsay shows on uh, pages 82 and 84? They have beautiful illustrations, and there was a curiosity about which ones those might possibly be. I don't have my book here. I can't be of help there. No. Yeah, and I didn't recognize them myself, but perhaps someone no. does. Anyway, I think... Uh, Thank you for um, popping out those uh, comments into um, the chat. And we're just going to mm -hmm. move move through now. So some key takeaways for, for move number four. Um, takeaway number one, uh, predictable, as in by pattern, picture, text. Don't allow students to practice decoding skills, which are essential to reading and instill bad habits that are hard to break. Um, and I, so some people had comments uh, there that were uh, definitely related uh, to that. So thank you for, for that. Key takeaway number two, the term decodable is relative. A book is decodable to a specific child if they have been taught its grapheme, phoneme correspondences. So we are encouraged to use books that are aligned with the phonic scope and sequence. And uh, that is so important because we know that each publication uh, company that is putting out decodable texts may be following a different scope and sequence. So it's really um, important to be mindful of the scope and sequence that you are using and following in your classroom and how the decodable books align with that. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number three, students will read slower at first, but they are making wonderful connections and eventually they will likely surpass those students who rely on the memorization pictures and context clues. Um, I think this lends itself very well to um, our first people's principle learning is takes patience and time. And so same said for students, uh, they're going to do it a bit slower at first, but they will make progress. And it's effortful for kids yeah. to read. It's not pleasant listening for the grown-ups that are supporting these little learners, that it does take time and it's laborious work. And so that is part of the process and kids need practice and they can do it. We have to remind them they are capable. Uh, next one. Takeaway number four, decodables are for practicing skills. 
students should still be exposed to rich readalouds, be supported through grade appropriate content material, and have access to authentic books. And so um, the analogy is used, like training wheels, students transition out of decodables as soon as they are ready. And I think that's really important. It's not an either or conversation. There is a specific purpose for decodable books as a means of skill building, and that we can also encourage authentic text reading, whether it's through read alouds or otherwise, that we are exposing children to all forms of text. Yeah, takeaway five, leveled texts can be repurposed. While we shouldn't assign students to a level or use them for guided reading anymore, they can be organized by topic in classroom libraries uh, and in book rooms. Yes. Um, and Katie, I know you're you're doing some work in, yeah. in that area this year. So that is really exciting for me. And I know in our my district, um, we were uh, presented with LLI materials uh, several years ago, and we have been making significant shifts to decodable and controlled texts for, um, from a variety of um, sources. Um, but a lot of these books are beautiful books, and we want to hold on to these resources. They cost thousands of dollars. So what we are working on now is creating text sets and not just with um, some of the LLI, but any of the books that we have from other leveled readers where we can group them according to uh, theme or genre, especially the nonfiction that we can provide a range of um, appropriate text to cover content. And so as uh, a new teacher librarian, I'm really excited about this opportunity to learn more about how we can do that for school communities. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much, um, Una. This is really helpful. There's just so much tech involved in these lovely little webinars. Uh, so we thought this would uh, be kind of fun. Let's assume that we have taught the graphemes S, L, B, P, T, as well as short A and I. So using your phone or your personal device, you can access the QR code. So the question is, what are words that students could decode or encode with those graphemes. Ooh, look at that, blast. That's a great one. I also want to mention, I see a couple of words here that I know my little learners in kindergarten struggled with. It was words that they may not fully um, have in their vocabulary, words like sap. And it can be tricky for some of these mm -hmm. uh, little learners to sound out a word. And if they don't have the background knowledge and if they don't have attached meaning to the word, it may make it additionally difficult for them to attach meaning or try and um, decode. So I know for a lot of my striving learners, we had to really cover vocabulary content, even with uh, CVC words. Split, so mm -hmm. fun. Slip, slab, I'm reading sideways, last. Yeah, so those oh, are some amazing words that once kids know um, the code and have covered that scope and sequence, there are a lot of words that they're able to decode as well as um, encode if we're focusing on print formation as well. So that can be super exciting. All right, move number five, embrace a better approach to teaching sight words. And this is a bit of a trigger word for me, and I know it's um, causing a lot of rich conversation about the definition of a sight word. And a sight word in its true definition is any word that we are able to lift off the page and read. And I think a lot of the conversation is around what a sight word is versus what a high frequency word is. And so those are really important definitions. And when we talk about high frequency words, we're talking about words that we are seeing more frequently in text. Um, for example, the word the, and that is you know, a word that we would see even in decodable text 
as we do have to provide some sight words, except we're not memorizing those sight words. We're really wanting to provide opportunities to orthographically map. And we do have words, uh, word lists like uh, dolch. I know that's what I was taught is start with dolch words. Um, or the fry list of words. And what we are now knowing is that a lot of those words are decodable, that there is no reason or purpose to memorizing words. That's not how we store these words in our long-term memory. So um, it was great learning for me a few years ago. I took in a webinar with really great reading and they offer free webinars uh, throughout the year. So that is another great source. Um, anyway, did you want to add anything to that, uh, Erica, before we move well, on? Well, uh, just briefly that, you know, again, as an intermediate teacher, what what's a sight word? What's a high frequency word? I've done a lot of learning since then. But I mean, for me, my, my um, habit prior to my own learning in, in uh, literacy was to kids can't read, well, just send them off to the learning assistants for support. And, you know, that is a completely unsustainable system, as I'm sure many of us know, and our learning assistants or inclusion support, whatever title you use in your area, are, you know, inundated with students. And, um, you know, certainly since I've been engaging in this and trying to help my students, I've been referring less and less each year. And, and that's how it should be. I'm a classroom teacher. It's my job to teach. I had to do some learning to get to the point where I was able to do that. And, and, you know, have I finished my learning journey? Absolutely not. But, um, you know, if you'd asked me before joining the LLL program, I'd say, I have no idea what a sight word really is. So it was good discussion. Again, the, the dynamic between Katie and I being an intermediate and a primary teacher, I've learned so much from yeah. her and she's learned so much from me in different perspectives. Um, so we hope that as we move into discussion here, you'll, you'll have, um, a variety of different perspectives as well and learn from each other. All right, so uh, our discussion questions for move number five, uh, how does this move connect to our British Columbia language arts curriculum? And how does it specifically connect to your grade or role? Of course, this question keeps coming up because we feel it's important to connect us back to our curriculum. Um, what Question two is what was your previous understanding of sight words? Um, what were you taught about the best way to teach these words to students? How has your understanding now changed? Um, question three, what is the heart word approach? How could this method support your instruction? And the final question for this uh, discussion uh, is Lindsay writes, every word wants to be a sight word when it grows up. What does she mean by this? I love this question. So I'm very curious to, to uh, hear what some of the answers are on that one. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we would love to invite you to share something in the chat that resonated with you from your um, conversations with uh, other BC educators. We'd love to hear from you. And it's a great way for um, those who are um, joining us to review and, and maybe pick up a few helpful tips in the chat. So please. Mm. Yeah, many people relying on strict memorization. Yeah, and that can be problematic because we just don't have, um, you know, the capability of memorizing all the words in our language. And so we really want to make sure that we're ortho orthographically mapping um, words and that we're giving kill kids those uh, foundational skills so that they can decode and encode. Mm -hmm. Questions about the BC curriculum? Yeah. You know, it would be interesting to note regarding our curriculum that it does reference three queuing, but does not reference decodable books as, you know, a potential strategy for um, learning the code. Hmm. Well, we'll keep the chat going and let's yeah. move on to our takeaways. All right, Katie, That'd I think be... you're on, yeah, oh. you're on the first one. Uh, takeaway number one, for reading researchers, sight words are any words that our brain has learned to read instantly as we have orthographically mapped their letters, sounds, and meaning. This includes words with regular 
and irregular spelling patterns. The letters and sounds are still processed, but in a fraction of a second. So it might even seem like children are memorizing. It's just that the process that they have learned or the process by which they are um, reading is so, so fast. Uh, takeaway number two, some words may only be temporarily irregular uh, for students until the spelling pattern is taught. Uh, example, the high frequency word C in kindergarten before they learn E pattern, only a small number of English words are permanently irregular. Um, this is a, the English language, of course, is fascinating and there's so much to know. And, and if you haven't just a couple of books, the ABCs and all their tricks mm -hmm. and the, uh, uncovering the logic of English, certainly helpful in our, my own understanding of the English language, Me too. um, certainly encourage you to go have a look at those. Um, they are helpful. Yeah. We'll have some fun with the mentee when we get to it. Take away mm -hmm. number three, it's important to teach students to sound out words even when they have irregular spelling patterns. We know memorizing words as holes or shapes is not effective um, in the long term and causes confusion with both reading and spelling. And our final takeaway, nonsense word fluency assessments can help us see whether a student is truly decoding, but it's not necessary to teach with nonsense words. Um, I find it fascinating when I assess um, my students, the nonsense words. Uh, sometimes they'll look at you and they're like, is that really a word? <laughs> and, and it's like, just, just keep, keep going. Yep. Yeah, we'll just keep going and, and they can decode it and they do and, and they think nothing of it. And, and it's certainly a fascinating process to watch. This next mentee is referencing some of these high frequency words that we often see in some of those decodable texts um, in some of the uh, early decodable series and so you can use your personal device and access them through the qr code and we're asking how decodable are these words first one being is is it completely irregular or is it completely decodable? Ooh, look at this. Ooh, so fun, Una. This was Una's suggestion. Thank you so much. This is kind of cool. Okay, there's a little bit of shifting. So it's just, almost like a race. You can see you're watching yeah. the dots go back and forth, like, you know, the little horse racing. And, <laughs> and so let's, let's quickly go through them because I am mindful of time. Number one, mm. the first word is is completely decodable. We know that the grapheme S spells two sounds um, s as well as Z. So once kids know that, it is fully decodable. We have the word C. This is also fully decodable. When we um, talk about the 44 phonemes, the sounds in our English language, um, E E is uh, a um, uh, vowel team that makes the long E sound and it is completely decodable. Uh, that is also completely decodable. The TH sound, uh, the TH digraph we know has two, uh, spells two sounds. It's the th as well as th. And once kids know that, and I do teach them in kindergarten, they can spell and decode that. Said, there's a good one, hey? Well, said is one that we would consider um, irregular and it's partially decodable. So we know that the beginning and the end um, of the word are decodable and d, and we have AI uh, in the middle, which is um, considered irregular. So that is one that we would really have to work on and, and uh, provide support to orthographically map. And that's one that we often say is uh, considered a heart word for our newest learners. Um, and then we have look also completely decodable. We know that the vowel team OO spells two sounds, U uh, as in look, but also U as in food. So that one is completely decodable. And three is also completely decodable. We have the digraph TH, we have ER, and we have the vowel team E. So uh, we just thought that would be fun to um, help solidify our learning and 
uh, yeah, I guess here we go. Thank you so much for um, joining us this evening. It was really lovely to uh, come together and have a chance to talk literacy shop to it at Newsom. And I think we're going to announce the winner of tonight's book prize, Una. Yes, congratulations, Kathy Murphy. You are the wonderful winner of the Art and Science of Teaching Primary Reading, which is one of my favorite texts. Uh, please send us an email at info at dyslexiacanada.org with your mailing address, and we can get that off to you as soon as we can. Well, that is super exciting as Kathy is a colleague and neighbor of mine. So that's wonderful, Kathy. Super exciting. Fantastic. And our next session, our last session is Monday, November 18th, uh, 7 p.m. And we will be focusing on move number six and seven. Move number six is fluency practice. And move number seven is improving comprehension through vocabulary and background knowledge. So we really hope uh, that you'll join us for our last session. Thank you, everyone. Heights up, Kath.